What's going on, everyone? We're going to talk about Wall Street and what has basically been Wall Street since the 80s when the flash crash began or when the flash crash took place. I believe firmly since that time and since all the research agrees, that is literally what's been driving the primary narratives and agendas moving forward since that time. Because that is also the same time at which digital became a thing. Paper began to not become a thing. And that transition in and of itself played a big role, as well as the specific acts of Salomon Brothers, where it all began, where we're going to start, and where it all is going to end up. So if you're not familiar with Salomon Brothers, this should be a very interesting story for you. I've covered Salomon Brothers a lot in the past, and this time I'm going to go a little bit more in depth. I'm going to start from the flash crash. We're going to go into it a little bit, and we're going to just show the dominance they had and what happened after the flash crash of 1987. So this is the introduction. So Salomon Brothers and the Flash Crash of 1987. Before we get into that, just to give you an idea of some of the alumni that were at Salomon Brothers at this time, which this was acquired, this building here was one New York Plaza, which was Salomon Brothers headquarters starting in 1970. And they traded under the NYSE as SB. Founded in 1910, that would be Salomon Brothers as a whole. So they were actually founded three years before the Federal Reserve actually was created. Now, what's a, another important thing to note about Salomon Brothers is that Arthur Salomon, Herbert Salomon, Percy Salomon, of course they're all related. It's a family operation that started way back in the early 1900s. They weathered through the Great Depression, all the way of World War I, World War II, and by the 1980s they had become and known, well known, as the king of Wall Street, being their CEO. So they were the most revered firm on Wall Street during the time of the flash crash of 1987. And amongst their ranks, you had people such as Michael Lewis, which was the creator and writer of The Big Short and, and things like Liar's Poker. You have Michael Bloomberg, who everybody knows Michael Bloomberg. He is <laughs> Michael Bloomberg on his Bloomberg News. He ran for mayor in New York City. Actually, strangely enough, if you look it up, 2001, September 11th, he was actually supposed to have his first primary that same day. Also, you have Michael Stockman. He had his career as a mortgage trader at Salomon, who then went on to serve as the chief risk officer at MF Global, which filed for bankruptcy October 31st of the year that this article here was published, which I believe was 2011. But there's a lot of renowned traders and a lot of renowned people that got their start at Salomon Brothers. You have people like John Bass, who later became Citigroup when it was acquired by Citicorp in the late 90s for the Big Bang. You have John Lipsky, who was the director of Sal uh, Salomon's European Economic and Market Analysis Group until 1992, which strangely enough, most of these people resigned or left Salomon either right before the flash crash took place or shortly thereafter. Then you have, of course, who could forget Louis Ranieri. He actually was considered by many to be the very cause of the 2008 financial crisis due to the fact that he was the literal pioneer of mortgage-backed securities, which contributed to a large part of why the crash occurred in 2008. And then you have the CEO who is known, again, as the King of Wall Street, John Gutfreund. Chairman of Salomon Brothers, once nicknamed the King of Wall Street, resigned in 1991 amid the Treasury bond scandal, which is what we're going to be getting into. Now, before we do that, let's go into what they did before this hearing took place. So, obviously, they acquired World Trade Center 7, and not just one or two floors, but many of them, and also with the likes of things like American Express, the U.S. Secret Service, Standard Chartered Bank, Securities and Exchange Commission, the U.S. Department of Defense, the Central Intelligence Agency, New York City's Office of Emergency Management, First State Management Corp., Hartford Financial Services Group, NAIC Securities, and the U.S. Secret Service. So there was a lot of big names in there. Oh, on, and on top of that, you have the Federal Home Loan Bank. So you have financial institutions with government, insurance, all together. Now, we all know what happened. We don't need to get into that. But I wanted you to see this video that came out. It was about, I think, about 10 or 15 years ago that describes Salomon Brothers in a little bit more detail. And I feel like it's a good place to stop in this one before we go a lot deeper. But just take a look at this video real quick. I thought they were dead all... Thought they were dead already. 
I'm Evan Newmark. I'm Dennis Berman. Dennis. You're already editorializing in the I, intro. I know. I, I read your piece. Good. I find, it's, it's endlessly fascinating, the death of Solomon Brothers. But they were dead, weren't they? They were dead a decade ago. But, of course, primary elements of the revered and sometimes reviled Wall Street firm kept living inside this somewhat uh, uncomfortable creation called Citigroup. So when uh, Citigroup was called upon to get big into the mortgage game, who did they call upon? The Solomon uh, Credit Desk, the uh, fixed income they desk. They did a great job. And they bought a lot of mortgages, Can a lot you, of paper, a lot me, of CDOs. I'm going to tell, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you a short story. Many years ago, 1986, I was offered a job by Goldman Sachs to start as an analyst. I went to Solomon Brothers for an interview. First guy I met with was an uh, associate at Solomon Brothers. I said to him, I have this offer from Goldman Sachs. You know what he said to me? Take it. He said, take it. <laughs> he said, this place is awful. You can't imagine how bad the culture is here. Wow, Isn't that true? Interesting. Hey, it was a ruthless, some say meritocratic, but a lot of people say ruthless culture that was formed inside that firm. So uh, you wanted to uh, make a buck. You went there, but you would have no friends. You'd have, uh, everyone was your enemy. It was what you could bring in. Uh, for profits for the firm. And some people thrived in that culture, some people did not. Perhaps you wouldn't have been one of those, but uh, it, uh, it, it, it was obviously diluted here, once, here, once here, it was bought by Travelers here's a question. and Citigroup. Yes. Has all of Wall, did all of Wall Street become Solomon Brothers culture? See, how's, that, how's that for a theory? Uh, that's an interesting theory, but of course Solomon was in some ways the proto Lehman Brothers, the proto Goldman Sachs, the uh, uh, proto Bear Stearns because they had a very big prop trading uh, operation. They used their own money. Uh, they went after opportunities that they saw. In some ways, uh, Goldman can be seen as a successor. Well, Goldman became a trader. Now the difference is so. is culture. Now this is a vague thing and, and it's hard to describe. But you worked inside Goldman. Yes. You understood how uh, regimented in some ways that were. How much very you had to powerful. How much you had to sacrifice your own personality. Solomon was in many ways the opposite of that. Right. But, but, it, but, but I think uh, one of the successes of Goldman is that culture. And the problem with City, and this is the point of the column, is that there is no culture. There's still 10 years after that deal to create City Group, you have disparate groups of people who are put together who in a lot of ways still can't get their act together. No act. They no got act. No act. They got no no act. act. Vikram Pandit's trying. He's trying, he's trying, so but here, Sandy here. Weil couldn't make it work, uh, Chuck Prince couldn't make it work, and, and Vikram's now got the, uh, the hard work ahead of him. Can he make it work? Uh, making the culture work? Yeah. I don't think so. It's no. really going to be a macroeconomic uh, situation. Doesn't matter anymore. And if the, macro, if the macro economy improves and city can make loans and maybe they can get it out of their government ownership stake, then maybe it will do okay. But I think the last decade has proven that Citigroup, as an idea, has largely failed. Every, it's still every man for himself. And maybe in that respect, the Solomon culture will live on. This is <laughs> but he's giving a we Solomonic end. I know. Well, I'm very religious this past okay, weekend. Okay. All right. I'm Evan Newmark from the Wall Street Journal. I'm